is the Martin Book Span, a name that is well known to most people in central Iowa, uh, a voice that's well known uh, certainly to most people who uh, listen to the radio in central Iowa. Mr. Bookspan is the uh, voice of the New York Philharmonic radio broadcast. He's uh, best known to us through first hearing on WOI. In addition, he's written many articles, uh, two books. All of that is in your program. I'll not take a lot of his time uh, to tell you uh, about Mr. Bookspan. Uh, I prefer to have him talk to us about uh, music and the mass media. Mr. Bookspan. Thank you, and let me repeat to this audience what I have told the audiences with whom I've met earlier today and last evening. It's a joy for me to be in your midst. I have never before been in Ames. I have heard of Iowa State University and its extraordinary work in the arts in recent years, and the remarkable hospitality that Ames extends to visiting musicians, lecturers, and what have you. And I must say that what I heard was not exaggerated one bit. I am delighted to bask in the hospitality that has been extended to me. And I am delighted to meet many people who are passionately devoted to the furthering of the arts, to the development of the arts, and to the nurturing of young people who obviously will become the audiences of the future. And in whose hands lies the future of the arts. First, let me begin by defining the topic that I have chosen to speak to you about is music and the mass media. Music, in the singular. There, of course, are many musics, current, folk music, country music, rock music, uh, and a whole variety, jazz, concert music. It is that last category, concert music in the terms by which we understand it, or the definition which will serve, will be that music which figures on the program this evening, which will figure on the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra program Thursday, the music of the concert hall, which is the cultural heritage which America has inherited in the first place from Europe, but then has gone on to develop on its own. So it is that kind of music which figures in the title Music and the Mass Media. And mass media, obviously plural, because there is a tendency in our society to identify a specific medium as generic, meaning the entire mass media structure, television, Television will figure in what I have to say this evening, but only as part of a larger whole. Radio, of course, newspapers, magazines, any medium which addresses the mass public and to which a mass public is available for its message. Having set the definition, let me then proceed to the burden of, of what it is that I feel we all ought to be involved in and about which we all ought to be concerned. And my first impulse is to say, ladies and gentlemen, the message is not a good one. Music in the mass media fares very badly. And I can make that statement, not have very much opposition to it, I don't believe. Thank you very much for the privilege of allowing me to come here and make that statement and sit down. However, I shall obviously not do that. The message is an unhappy one, but it is within our power to turn that around. Now, let me first elaborate just briefly on the unhappy state of affairs that exists in the mass media with respect to music. There was a time not too long ago in this country when the organs of public communication the magazines and the newspapers, and here I'm going to exempt radio and television for the moment, when those media, magazines and newspapers, covered in much greater depth than they now do 
the activities in the concert world. Some of the reasons for that are self-evident. In the first place, there are fewer newspapers now than there used to be not too many years ago. New York, from where I come, has now one morning newspaper and two evening newspapers. Three papers in the metropolitan New York area, which serve 15 million residents. And 15 years ago, there were upwards of 10 and perhaps even a dozen newspapers serving that same population. The shrinkage, which has been caused by the disappearance of newspapers, has resulted in a shrinkage of coverage. And one of the first places to go, one of the first areas hit, is the area of the arts. I don't think that's peculiar to the media. I think we experience it on all levels of our society. When there is a budget crunch, it's the arts that gets kicked first. And that has happened where coverage of the arts in newspapers is concerned. I had an interesting session earlier today with one of your local newspaper people. The discussion went in various directions, but one of the topic areas that we covered was coverage of music in Ames and the need for that coverage, which I think may come as something of a surprise to you if I say that not only is it important here in Ames, but it is important nationally. It's important nationally because there are centers of musical activity and arts activity generally that make their impact felt throughout the nation. And whether you're ready to believe it or not, Ames, Iowa is one such place. Outside of Ames, we are very interested in knowing what is happening in Ames. Outside of Ames, there is a great respect shown toward the activities here at Iowa State University and the ferment that seems to be going on and growing constantly. Where there once was a possibility of taking a place like Ames for granted, that possibility no longer exists. Ames cannot be taken for granted, nor can Grinnell be taken for granted, nor can Waco, Texas be taken for granted. And every touring artist who appears in Ames and in the other comparatively unimportant places that I've just mentioned, every artist must know that an appearance in Ames or in Waco is covered locally by a responsible journalist and critic who has the best interests of the art at his heart and can reflect very accurately and with a good deal of knowledge and perception the event in Ames. And in turn, that local coverage gets known and heard in the large metropolitan centers. New York concert managers are very dependent upon a complete knowledge of what is happening in places like Ames. So don't for a moment think that here in Ames you're in a small, isolated vacuum. That is hardly the case. And what happens here in Ames is important for Ames and for New York, Boston, Washington, D.C., and for the nation at large. And I think it's very important that there be good coverage, responsible coverage, accurate coverage, and caring coverage of the activities that take place in your arts life here in Ames. Newspapers. Radio and television I'll get to in a moment. The magazine picture I want to talk about for just a moment. The national periodicals in the magazine field, Newsweek, Time, U.S. News and World Report, those are the three uh, big circulation magazines, and those are two of the three which devote some of their space to the coverage of the arts. There was an extraordinary exception last week in Newsweek magazine to the statement that I'm about to make. In the magazine field, 
As seriously as in the newspaper field, there is shrinking coverage of the arts. Now, that extraordinary exception to which I alluded was the appearance on the cover of Newsweek last week of the violinist Yitzhak Perlman. I'm sure many of you saw that issue, read the article. A uh, beautiful piece of reporting, sensible journalism, responsible journalism, an avenue of coverage which I'm sure will entice at least some of the readers of Newsweek to anticipate the appearance of Perlman and his colleagues in their cities the next time Perlman appears, wherever it is he is scheduled to appear. It may serve as a, a seduction, if you will, to bring into the concert people who otherwise might never consider that. And that is an incredibly important result of the coverage by the mass media of the arts generally and of music specifically and of the kind of music that I defined at the outset. One of my strongest held beliefs is that it doesn't take much to get that kind of music into the mainstream of everyday Mr. and Mrs. America. What it does take is exposure to it and repeated exposure. And if that exposure gradually diminishes and shrinks, as in fact is the case, we are in grave danger of losing the structure of our lives and our society. Because the arts, it's going to be a cliche, the arts are enriching, ennobling, they lend a grace to what might otherwise be rather routine living, and without the arts as part of everybody's everyday experience, our entire nation is the poorer. Radio and television. Radio a sound medium has almost from its very beginnings been a haven for the broadcasting, for the dissemination of the kind of music that we're talking about. And those of you whose memories go back to the days when I remember, the broadcasting of live concerts was an integral part of any responsible broadcasting organization. Not only network radio, but even local radio. There were times when local radio stations had in their employ musicians who performed on a regular basis from the local broadcast studio, concerts, programs, whatever, which involved the dissemination and the implantation of music into the fabric of that community. And when we talk about the networks, of that period, we're talking about really glory days in the history of music and one of the mass media. Because it was a commonplace, most of this was crammed into the weekend, to be sure, but to hear live broadcast concerts by the Philadelphia Orchestra, the Boston Symphony, the Metropolitan Opera, which happily still continues to this day on Saturday afternoon, the New York Philharmonic live concerts Sunday afternoon, this was augmented and supplemented by a whole host of other programs. The Mutual Radio Network, which was the low man on the totem pole in terms of competing with the other three networks, nevertheless had a fine symphony orchestra on its staff. It was then conducted by Alfred Wallenstein. And in order to compete with the NBC Symphony, for example, the Mutual Broadcasting System Network offered concerts of diverse musical fare, some of it most unusual, and it was on Mutual that an entire cycle of the piano concertos of Mozart was broadcast, the first and still to my knowledge the only time in the broadcasting history of this country that such an event occurred. Chronological sequence of the entire cycle of Mozart piano concertos with Nadia Reisenberg as the pianist and Wallenstein conducting the Mutual Network Symphony Orchestra. On CBS, when the New York Philharmonic was off-season, the CBS Symphony filled that Sunday afternoon time slot. And 
one of the great programs in American radio history, a series called Invitation to Music, which was part of an Invitation to cycle that the CBS radio network uh, broadcast. Another in that series was called Invitation to Learning, in which distinguished works of literature were discussed, analyzed, in some cases dramatized. But the Invitation to Music series was a pioneering effort in exploring byways of the musical literature. It involved the CBS Symphony Orchestra. Its music director for that series was Bernard Herrmann, a name that those of you who are movie buffs will instantly recognize as the composer of some of the most extraordinary motion picture scores in the history of the American cinema. Citizen Kane, Fahrenheit 451, uh, well, it's, a, it's an enormously impressive list, the Magnificent Ambersons and so on. But Benny Herman, as he was affectionately known to all who knew him, introduced many American listeners to music of Mahler, for example. Benny Herman conducted orchestral works of Charles Ives in the 1930s, when Ives was a name unknown to all but the most dedicated aficionados. And that element of radio's activity as a musical avenue was of tremendous importance. Now you may say, well, that may be all well and good, but look at the riches with which we're faced today, particularly here in Ames, where you have an extraordinary AM and FM station, WOI, which brings to your living rooms or dens, wherever you listen, the finest music performed by the world's most renowned artists, most of it, of course, recorded, some of it live tapings of concerts which take place in the home auditoria of various orchestras. I don't for a moment want to denigrate that kind of broadcasting activity. At the same time, though, I must point out that there is nothing, and here my own prejudice is going to come right to the front, there is nothing that takes the place of the live experience. If one cannot attend in person, the next best thing is having live broadcasting of that concert experience. And I do hope that the future may, in fact, bring us back, at least partially, to that kind of situation. Some of you, I'm sure, have heard about and read about the broadcast satellite, which shortly will be used by National Public Radio for the transmission to distant points of programs which it originates at any individual point. I hope very much that that satellite will be employed by NPR for the dissemination of live music on radio. The young people seated in this audience have no idea of the kind of extraordinary excitement and visceral involvement that that can entail on the part of a listener. When you know that what you're hearing is being played at that very moment, 2,000 miles away in a concert hall, there's a dynamic involved there that's irreplaceable. There's also a dynamic involved in the broadcast itself, which is irreplaceable. Live broadcasting, with all its potential hazards and dangers, is one of the most exciting events in which a broadcaster can engage. Yesterday, after Dr. White met me at the airport on our drive from Des Moines, we were talking about live broadcasting. And one of my most cherished memories leaped into my recollection. It was during the course of a live broadcast of a Boston Symphony concert. Rudolf Serkin was playing the second piano concerto of Brahms. And at the start of the third movement, that movement which begins with that marvelously rich mellow cello solo, after which the piano makes its entrance, there was no piano entrance. And it turned out that the lyre mechanism, the pedal mechanism at the bottom of the piano, had torn away from the instrument itself so that there was no way that Serkin could have played at that entrance point. 
and Charles Munch was conducting. We were on the air live. Sirkin looked up at Munch at the moment when he was supposed to come in and went like this, and Munch went like this, and it was one of the great moments in my broadcasting career. It took about 15 minutes for them to improvise a repair of that disaster. They finally did improvise it, and during the course of that long delay, I had the moment that we all hope for, but which rarely comes, the opportunity freely to bring the audience into the drama that was taking place at that moment on the stage and try to create a personal involvement in the action or the lack of action that was taking place, the reasons for it and why. Now, of course, were that concert a taped concert, all that would have been taken care of with the razor blade. There would have been a splicing together and none of the drama, none of the excitement would have been felt by the audience that later would have listened to the broadcast. So there are dangers, and I use dangers, I have to put quotes around it. I don't consider that a danger. I consider that a marvelously rich potential. But if you want to call it a danger, so be it. The dangers inherent in live broadcasting are infinitely overcome by the presence, the excitement, and the challenge of the live situation. I've saved for last the medium which is the most communicative, the one which really has, without any question, the greatest impact on the audience, and that, of course, is television. A few years ago, were I delivering this address, I would have painted a picture of total gloom and doom. These days, the picture is considerably brighter than that, but there is a long way to go. With the emergence of public television, PBS, and with its increasing concentration on the broadcasting of concert music and opera, there is a regular outlet in the public broadcasting area for a public to be able to participate in the televising of music, of concerts, and of operatic performances. But that's far from good enough, very far from good enough. It is incumbent upon all of us to exercise our power, and yes, ladies and gentlemen, we do have power in this regard, to exercise our power to try to impress upon the commercial television broadcasters that they have not only a responsibility but an opportunity in this area. The opportunity of bringing to the mass public, we're talking about the mass media, television is a mass medium, but public television is not a mass medium. The audience that watches public television at any one given time is at most 10% of the total available audience. And whether it's by habit, by conditioning, or by preference, the audience that watches television watches commercial television. And it's commercial television which must be galvanized and which must be harnessed. And there are ways of doing it. I'll get to some of those ways in a moment. Even in the commercial television area, things begin to look better now than they did as recently as a year ago. For reasons that are tied not only to a feeling of responsibility, but also to good sound dollars and cents, NBC, among the commercial television broadcasters, has made some tentative moves in the direction of what they term cultural programming. Last January 9th was the first in a series of programs which will bear the overall rubric live from Studio 8H. And Studio 8H, to those of us whose memories go back, mean, Studio 8H means Arturo Toscanini and the NBC Symphony Orchestra. It also means dead, dry, terrible acoustics, but that's another issue entirely. 
Live from Studio 8H is an attempt on the part of the commercial network, NBC, to introduce into the commercial stream cultural programming. That first broadcast in January had the New York Philharmonic under Zubin Mehta with Leontine Price and Yitzhak Perlman. Mr. Perlman is omnipresent these days. Just last week, there was a broadcast which inaugurated another cultural series on the NBC television network, NBC Live Theater. Now, bear in mind that both these series, live from Studio 8H, NBC Live Theater, there's that word again, live, the communicative power of the live production being seized upon as a means of impelling this kind of programming into the mainstream of television scheduling and viewing. When I say there is more than altruism involved, let me just briefly expand upon that. You undoubtedly know that of the three commercial networks, NBC ranks third these days in terms of ratings. CBS and ABC this season are neck and neck, and this week and next, both those networks are going to fire their biggest guns in terms of what they think will be programming to attract the largest possible audience, because the determination as to the winner of this sweepstakes, as to who comes out on top, will be made in the next two weeks. ABC has scheduled a rerun of the film The Sting. Uh, CBS is running a two-part dramatic presentation of the events in Jonestown. I guess the first one is tomorrow night? Whenever, or tonight and tomorrow night, whenever. But this is obviously a competitive race on the part of ABC and CBS to emerge as the number one network for the 1979-1980 season. And what's involved is millions of dollars in advertising revenue. Because on the strength of who emerges in the number one position, budgets will be allocated by the advertising agencies for next season, 81-82, uh, uh, 80-81. And millions of dollars hinge on that. Even if whoever ultimately emerges as number one emerges by one-tenth of one percentage point, NBC has no stake in that race at this point. They are third and really a hopeless third. Variety of reasons for that. But one of the methods that the president of NBC has taken is to try at this juncture in the fortunes or misfortunes of that network to inject cultural programming into the commercial structure. The rating numbers on Live from Studio 8H in January were about as poor as had been anticipated in advance. When I said the largest audience that watches any offering on public television is roughly 10%, that's about the audience that watched Live from Studio 8H about 10% of the potential available audience in that time period. But an extraordinary thing happened. There were three participating commercial sponsors in that program. Every one of them the next day called the NBC sales department and said, we want to be in the next live from Studio 8H. And the NBC sales department received many calls from other advertising agencies saying, please let us know the next live from Studio 8H that you schedule because we have clients whom we want to put in that program. We're slowly getting to the point, I hope, where the audience in terms of numbers becomes less important to the advertisers than the audience in terms of its quality. And while only 10% of the available audience is likely to watch cultural programming, that 10% is a quality audience, which represents an enormous buying power. And let's face it, broadcasting in this country is pretty much an advertising medium, both radio and television, except for the public 
radio and television networks. But radio and television in America is principally a medium for advertising. The programming has been tailored for the greatest numbers, but if there starts to creep in a suspicion that numbers are important, but also quality of that particular audience that's watching and listening, then we begin to start to till a whole new, undeveloped, and very rich soil. Now, how can we, all of us, individually and together, make our wishes and our power, to use the word I used before, how can we make our power felt in the places where it will count? You would be amazed to know to what degree policy decisions are taken on the highest level based upon mail that arrives at the desks of the executives of the television networks. There is an untapped resource of power which the music community has not begun to appreciate. And if enough awareness is stimulated in this audience, and you in turn stimulate your friends and neighbors, and that in turn starts to snowball, and you write letters to the presidents of the networks and the vice presidents in charge of programming, that has within it the potential to turn the entire structure of programming around. I don't exaggerate. It's important that you take this message. If you take anything away from this lecture, please take away this message. You are powerful. In terms of determining the program structure of American broadcast media, both radio and television. And upon you lies the potential of turning around some very hard preconceived notions by programmers in terms of what will and what will not work. So music and the mass media really do have an integral connection one with the other. When I defined or spoke first about radio, I said a sound medium. Television, of course, is a visual medium. And there are infinite ways yet to be discovered whereby television can act as a proper means of transmission of music. It's one thing to put cameras in front of an orchestra, to pan to a specific section, or an individual soloist when that section or soloist is prominently featured at any specific point in a score. But that becomes almost Mickey Mouse uh, in imitation. Imitating with the picture the sound seems to me the easiest and the laziest way out of televising music. There are magnificently gifted creative minds in the television field, not only in this country but abroad, who have visualized music in extraordinary ways. There's a Swiss director who made a film of the concertino for piano and small orchestra by the composer Otto Honig. Collectively can bring about the reversal of what until now for the past 20 odd years has been an outrageous neglect we can turn that around so that we, our children and their children, will experience a new glory period in terms of music and the mass media. It's a part of everybody's life. It's part of 20th century technology. It can be used in glorious ways, and we can help bring that about. I thank you very much for your time and attention, and I really must not leave this position without once again thanking you and the entire community of ISU for a remarkably warm, receptive, and involved 
situation to which I've been privileged to come and off which I am so pleased to be a part. Thank you so much. Thank you.